Hello and welcome to the introduction for this course. What you should know before you take the course. You should have a basic working knowledge of using a computer. Also a basic working knowledge of using the internet. Who should take this course? This course is designed for absolute beginners to SQL and beginners to PostgreSQL. What will you learn on the course? We'll start off by installing the PostgreSQL database server. We'll then learn how to load a sample database into the PostgreSQL server. We will then create a database and a table. We'll insert some data into the table. We will also query data inside the table. We will update existing data in a database table. We'll also delete data from the table. We'll also learn how to use sub queries to retrieve data. We will learn how to sort data retrieved from a database table. We'll also learn how to filter the data we retrieve using the WHERE clause. We will learn how to remove duplicate records. We will also learn how to use subqueries to query data from a database table. We will learn how to group data using the group by clause. We will also learn how to use the having clause to further group related data. The course for the format of the course is video based and the duration of the course is 2.5 hours. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello there. What is PostgreSQL? PostgreSQL is a general purpose and object relational database management system. It is portable. That means it can run on multiple platforms like Windows, Mac OS X, Solarix, and Unix. It was basically designed to run on Unix-like platform, but it can also run on other platforms as well. That's why it is portable. PostgreSQL is free and open source. What that means is that the source code is available under the PostgreSQL license. So it's a liberal open source license. So you're free to use, to modify and distribute PostgreSQL in any form. PostgreSQL requires very minimum maintenance because of its stability. There are lots of companies that are using PostgreSQL. Let's take a look at some notable companies. So this is just a very brief list of some notable companies that are currently using PostgreSQL. So notable ones include Apple, we've got Skype, we've got Cisco and many others. Hello and welcome. What is SQL? SQL stands for Structured Query Language. It is the language used to communicate and manipulate databases. SQL is also popularly referred to as SQL. SQL is an American National Standards Institute standard. That means it is a standard language regulated by the American National Standard Institute. There are different versions or flavors of the SQL language. For example, Oracle has got its own proprietary extension to the language. Also, Microsoft SQL Server has got its own proprietary extension to the language. However, to be compliant with the American National Standard Institute, all flavors of the SQL language 
must support certain key elements the same way. For example, they must support things like select, update, delete, insert, and where. These are all keywords in the SQL language. So regardless of the flavor or versions of the SQL language you're using, they must all support select, update, delete, insert, and where. These are all important keywords and clauses used in the SQL language. Let's look at some of the things that we can achieve using the SQL language. We can execute queries against a database. We can retrieve data from a database. We can insert records into a database. We can update existing records inside the database. We can delete records from a database. We can also create new tables in a database as well as create views in a database. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, I'll be showing you some minimum requirements that has to be met before PostgreSQL can be installed on your computer. So these are the minimum requirements, um, regardless whether you are using, if you're using a Windows, a Linux, or a Mac. So these are the operating systems that you can install PostgreSQL if you are on a Windows. So it doesn't matter if you're on a 32-bit or a 64-bit. Uh, Windows operating system. This B here basically means bit. I just left out the I and the T to create some space. So if you've got Windows 7, 8 or 10, then your machine should be ready to accept the installation. Also, if you have Windows 20, 2008 server, Windows 2012 server, you need a minimum of one gigahertz of processor speed. This is just the absolute minimum. You need at least one gigabyte of RAM. You need at least a gigabyte of hard disk space. You need an account that has an administrator role that you can use to perform the installation. However, we, if you've got an account that's got an admin um, role or privilege, you can usually right click on the installation file and select run as admin. For Linux, if you are running a Linux 32 or 64 bit, these are the operating systems you can use. You can use a CentOS 6.x and 7, Ubuntu 14.04, Debian 7 and 8, Oracle Enterprise Linux 6 and 7, and again, a minimum of one gigahertz processor speed is required, one gigabyte RAM. You need to have a super user privilege on an account. You need that before you can perform the installation. If you are on a Mac, you can install PostgreSQL on OS X server 10.8, 10.9, and 10.10. You need a minimum one gigahertz processor power or speed, one gigabyte RAM or memory. You also need a super user account with super user privileges to perform the installation. So these are the bare minimum requirements if you're running Windows, Linux, or Mac and you wish to install PostgreSQL. These are the absolutely bare minimum requirements. So that is it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello there. In this video, I'll be showing you how to install PostgreSQL on your local system.
Postgres was developed for Unix like platforms. However, it has been designed to be portable. What that means is that it can run on multiple platforms such as Mac OS, Solaris and Windows. I will be illustrating by installing Postgres on a Windows based platform. Let's take a look at the steps that we are going to follow to complete the installation of PostgreSQL. So we are going to start off by downloading PostgreSQL installer for Windows. If you're installing on Windows, you do that via an installer. So once we've downloaded it, we will then install PostgreSQL and we'll then verify the installation. If you are running Windows 8 or Windows 10, you will need to install PostgreSQL on an account that has administrative privileges. So let's begin by downloading the PostgreSQL installer for Windows and the link is displayed on the screen. So if you head over to that link and then we can begin the download of the installer. So once you've navigated to the installer download page, there is a link that says download the installer certified by Enterprise DB for all supported PostgreSQL versions. So click on the link and select there should be an option here for cookies. You can click OK to agree. And then you select your version. Select the latest version that you can see. The latest version is usually displayed on top. As of the time of recording this video, the version is 10.5. So I'm going to click on that. And next you got to select your operating system. So I'm going to click on the drop down and select my operating system. I am running a Windows 64 bit. So I click on that and then you have the link to download. So just click on the download now and it will begin the download. So that's my download there. It has started. I just give it a few minutes to complete the download. So the download has finished. So I'm just going to double click on the link here to run the installation. You may get a user account control pop-up if you're running a Windows operating system. Just click yes to accept that and that will allow the installation to begin. So the installation is being processed at the moment. So we just let it um, go through the steps for processing and initializing the application. You'll be presented with a setup wizard. So click on next and you are presented with a default installation directory. You can accept that or you can specify your own installation directory. I would recommend you accept the suggested location that Postgres has specified. Just click next and then you have this select component option. So make sure you accept all the boxes that have been checked. What that means is that it will install all the options here checked. PostgreSQL Server, the PG Admin 4, Stack Builder, Command Line Tool. Just accept all and click next. And it tells you a data directory. It has specified a data directory for you. You can either change that or accept the default. I would accept the default. Click next. Next, you are given an option for a password. So you have to provide a password for the database super user for the Postgres database. So specify 
a password that you can remember. So this password here that you, you're setting up now is going to be the password for the database super user and service account. So once you've set that up, click on next and it's specified a port. Please select the port number the server should listen to. The server has to listen to a specific port. So you have to specify one by default. A port 5432 has been suggested for you. Please leave it as the default port and click next. And then you are asked for a database cluster if you want to set up a cluster. I would advise you use, you leave the default, which is default local, leave that as the default and just click next. And click next again and then click next again. And we just wait for the installation to run through. The installation may take a few minutes to complete. The installation has now completed. You can uncheck this box here for the stack builder. The stack builder basically can be used to download and install additional tools, which include drivers and applications that will complement your PostgreSQL installation. So I've unchecked that because um, that is not necessary at this stage. When you're done, just click on the finish button. Let's verify the installation. There are several ways to verify the installation. For example, you can try to connect to the PostgreSQL database server from any client application, for example, PSQL or PG admin. However, the quickest way to verify the installation is through the PG admin application. So let me show you how to access that. To access the PG admin application, you do that from the programs menu and you click on the PostgreSQL folder. I'm just going to click to expand that. And within that, we've got this PG admin four, which is an administrative tool for administering PostgreSQL database and its various objects. So click on that to launch it. The PG4 is an admin tool for managing PostgreSQL. So let's on that this browser here. Let's click on the plus sign and on the servers, we've got PostgreSQL 10. Click on that and let's try. It's trying to connect to the server. It says you're currently running version 3.2 of PG admin. However, the current version is 3.3. Please keep click here for more information if you want to do that. So let's expand the server. We can, you can click to update it if you wish, but I'm just going to exit out of that for now. And you can notice here it's giving you option to enter the password. So this would have been the password that you would have entered when you were trying to run during the installation process. So if you enter that password in there, it should let you connect to the server. You've got the option to save, but for, if, for security reasons, I don't think that's a good practice. So once you've entered that, click OK. And it says, you can see here on the bottom here, it says server connected, which means you have successfully connected and verified the installation. Once you have connected and if everything is fine, the PG admin will display all the objects that belongs to the server. So if I expand where it's called databases, you'll be able to see all the various objects that belongs to the server. You can see all these are all objects and we're able to verify that because the installation has been a success. To see the properties of each of the objects here, you can just click on the object. 
for example, if I click on databases, you can see it shows that this is a Postgres database. The owner is this, and then you can click on other objects as well, login groups and so on. So that concludes the installation of PostgreSQL. So congratulations if you have successfully installed the PostgreSQL database server on your local system. If you had any problem during the installation, please feel free to let me know. I'll do my best to help. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello there. In this video, I will be showing you a couple of ways to connect to a PostgreSQL database. The first is via an interactive SQL shell, which is a terminal. It's called PSQL. And the second option is by a GUI. GUI basically is a graphical user interface using the PG admin tool. Let's try and connect to a PostgreSQL database using the PSQL tool. The PSQL is an interactive terminal program provided by PostgreSQL. So you can do a lot with it. For example, you can execute SQL statements. You can manage database objects and so on. So let's try and play around with the tool and connect to the database. The first thing we need to do is launch the PSQL program and you launch that from the PostgreSQL folder. So if you expand the folder and if you scroll down, you should see the SQL shell, which is PSQL. So if you click to launch the shell, so this is the shell. So the first thing you need to do basically is provide answers in different steps just by pressing tab or enter on your keyboard. So if you press enter, it will give you the name of the database. You press enter again, it will give you the port it is listening to. You press enter again, it will give you the username. Press enter and it will prompt you for a password. So you enter the password that you specified during the installation of PostgreSQL. Once you enter the password, if it's correct, it will give you this screen and you can see you've got the hash symbol next to the Postgres, which means it is waiting for some instructions. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to type in a very simple SQL statement to determine the version of PostgreSQL. So you just type in select and then you do a space, type in version. So make sure you wrap the version number in parentheses, opening and closing and then you terminate it with a semicolon, press enter. It will give you the version. So you can see here, this simple statement is giving me the version of PostgreSQL. So you can see from the here, this statement has returned one row. So we've successfully connected to the PostgreSQL database. To exit out of the program, all you need to do is hit Ctrl and C and you will get a prompt asking you to terminate. Just hit yes and press enter and that will terminate the program. So let's take a look at a second method we can use to connect to a PostgreSQL database using the PG admin tool. This tool is a GUI application. That means it is a graphical user interface that you can see things in a graphical way. To access the PG admin tool, you need to open up the PostgreSQL folder by expanding it. And you should see 
the PG Admin 4 tool. Just click to launch the tool. It's an administrative tool. So we'll give it a few minutes to fully launch. So this is what the PG Admin tool looks like. When you launch it, you have to select an object in the tree view. This is a tree view. So you click on the plus to expand it. You can see a red cross there, which means you have not connected to the server. So if you just click on it, it will give you this pop-up box to enter your password to connect to the server. If you don't want to enter the password each time, you could click on save, but I wouldn't recommend that. It's not really a good practice, although it's okay if you're working in your own environment, but it's good to develop good practices um, right from the start. So I'm not going to save the password. I'm just going to enter the password I entered during the installation of the database. So I'll click OK. And you can see here it tells me the server is connected. So I can now access the database objects. You can see if I expand that, you can see all the various objects belonging to the database. We can quickly run a very basic query to test that we can communicate with the database. So in this view tree here, under databases, make sure you've got the Postgres database selected. And then on the tools, click on the query tool. The query tool is where you'll execute your query. So let's type in a simple query. So I do select, I do a space, I type in version and then wrap it round parentheses and then I will add a semicolon so this if you just press this here this little symbol that looks like a lightning bolt and that will execute the query for you all right so it has now executed the query so if you put your mouse over the output here you can see the output that was returned which is this text displayed there so we've successfully been able to determine the version of the Postgres database from a very simple query. To exit the PG admin tool, you just click on the X and it will ask you a prompt. Are you sure you want to leave? Just say leave and that exits the application. You can also connect to a PostgreSQL database from other applications. So any applications that supports the ODBC driver or the JDBC driver can be used to connect to a Postgres database server. In addition, if you develop an application that uses an appropriate driver, the application can connect to the PostgreSQL database server using that driver. So let me quickly explain what ODBC and JDBC is. ODBC stands for Open Database Connectivity. It is an open standard application programming interface, which is API, that is used for accessing a database. JDBC stands for Java Database Connectivity, um, which is an application programming interface as well, API, for programming language Java. There's a programming language called Java. So it defines how a client can access a database. So it's basically a Java-based data access technology used for Java database connectivity. In this video, you have learned how to connect to Postgres database server by using different client tools, which included PSQL and PG admin tool. 
Okay, I'll also briefly introduce you to ODBC and JDBC. So these are APIs that can be used to connect to Postgres database from other applications. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello there. In this video, we are going to download and load a sample PostgreSQL database. I have already downloaded the database for simplicity and the database is basically in a zipped format. So I've got the database in a folder here. So I'm just going to click on it. So this is the database. It will be available for you to download under the resource area for this lecture. It's in a zipped format. So you need to have a software extraction tool to extract the database. So you can use WinRAR, you can use WinZip or any software extraction tool you have available. You can use that to extract the database content. So let me walk you through the steps we are going to take to download and load the sample PostgreSQL database. So we're going to start off by extracting the zipped database. We're going to extract it to a dot tar format. Once we've done that, we're going to create a folder on the C drive or any drive you wish, and then we'll place the extracted tar format into that folder and we will create a new database using the PSQL tool. We need to create a database to restore the sample database into. Once we've created a new database, we'll then have to load that sample database using a command line tool. If you're on a Windows, you use the command prompt. If you're on a Mac, you can use the terminal. Once we've loaded that, we'll then verify the loaded sample database by running just a basic query to make sure everything works. So let's begin by extracting the database. I'm just going to click on this folder here and the software extraction tool I have is called WinRAR, which is actually free to use. So I'm just going to right click and click on extract here and it will extract the content. You can see now it has extracted the content. You can see this is the extracted content. If I right click and click on properties, you can see that it is now a dot tar format. All right. So what I need to do is now go into my C drive. Let me right click and copy this and I'll quickly go to my C drive and on my C drive, I will create a folder called temp just by right clicking and going on folder and I'll call this folder temp and inside this temp folder I'm just going to right click and paste the tar formatted file so this is the extracted database in the tar format I've placed it into a folder on my C drive called temp Next thing we need to do is create a database using the PSQL tool. So within the PostgreSQL folder, just click to expand that and then click on the SQL shell, which is the PSQL. And what we need to do is create a new database. So just press enter to just provide some answers until you get the prompt to log in. All right, so we've got the username, now you need to enter your password. So enter the password you entered during the installation of the database. Once you've entered the password, you need to create a new database. And the way you do that, you type in the command create. You do a space followed by the word database. Okay, you do a space followed by the name of the database. 
and the database is going to be called DVD Rental. Okay, DVD Rental. That is the name of the database. And then you end that with a semicolon. You press enter. You may get a prompt to enter the password. If you do get the prompt, just enter the password. If you don't get the prompt, you it will return back to the command line, which means it has created the database. So once you get that create database, that means the database has now been created. The next thing we need to do is load the sample database from the temporary file that we extracted it to. So to do that, we need to open our command line tool if you're using Windows, or you can use the terminal if you are on a Mac. That's my command prompt. I'm just going to right click and click run as administrator and that will open up a terminal window. So this is my command prompt here. So the first thing I want to do is just navigate to the C drive. So I do that by typing CD dot dot and that will navigate backwards. I do CD again dot dot and press enter and that will give me the C drive. So I've now navigated to the C drive. The next thing I want to do is locate where my Postgres SQL was installed and add that to the path. So what I need to do is open up my folder and go to my programs menu and locate usually in program files. So that's my Postgres SQL folder here. So I'm just going to click on that and then click inside that and then click in the bin. So this is what we want. So what you do, highlight the, this path here for the bin directly, just copy that. And then we go back into our command prompt, just type in CD and then you paste the path into it and press enter. You can see now we are now referencing the bin directory from the Postgres installation. So I'm just going to type in CLS to clear the screen so that I only have the path I want. The next thing I want to do is to use the PG restore tool to load data into the DVD rental database. So this is the tool here. I pasted in this here. So you have PG underscore restore. You do the dash underscore capital U that basically specifies Postgres user to log in to the Postgres SQL database. That's what that is. And then we have the DVD rental. Okay. And that is a path to the extracted sample database. So we just press enter and that will ask you for a password to the database. So we just enter the password to the server and press enter. You may get some errors. So if your console or your terminal is clear and it returns to this command here, that means it would have loaded the database. So if we launch the PG admin GUI tool, we can use that to check the database that was loaded. So open up the GUI tool by locating it inside your PostgreSQL folder. So that's my PostgreSQL folder. And I'm just going to click on PG admin four. And that's my PG admin four tool here. So this is the tool here. So it tells you here on the databases is giving me four here. So if I expand that, I've already expanded it. You can see the DVD rental database. So if I expand that, you can see all the objects belonging to that database. If I come here and on the schemas, we've got the public schema and these are all the objects of the schema. If I click here, you can see the tables. These are all the tables. There are 15 tables in this sample database. 
So if I want, I can do a quick test by going on the tools here and opening the query window. It's saying no object selected. I need to select an object. So I select this schema and come here and do query and it will reference that schema. You can see here it's got DVD rental. That means it's referencing that database. So I should be able to execute a query against any of the database tables. So I'm just going to pick this table called actor. So I will type in select and star from the table called actor. I'm using the asterisk because I want it to select to return all the records from that table and then press this symbol here and you can see the output here it tell me successfully it has returned 200 rows from this table so this is a verification that we have successfully loaded the sample database in this video we downloaded and loaded a sample postgresql database we started off by extracting the zipped database into a .tar format. We created a temp folder on the C drive and placed the extracted tar format into that database. We then created a new database in PostgreSQL using PSQL. You have to create a database in order to load the sample database into. So we did that. We then loaded the sample database using the command line tool and we were able to verify the loaded sample database by running a very basic query on one of the tables in the database. Thanks for watching. If you had any problems during the loading of the database, please feel free to contact me. I'll be more than happy to help. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. I'm going to introduce you to some basic database concepts. I'm going to start with a database. What is a database? A database is basically a collection of organized information or data that is stored in a table. So let's take a look at an illustration of what a database looks like. So this is a basic illustration of a database. So a database stores information or data in a table. So this is basically a table and a table consists of columns. The columns are the ones across in blue and it also consists of rows. These rows are known as records. So each record is unique in a table. So we now know that a database stores information in a table. What is a table? A table basically stores information in rows and columns just like in an Excel spreadsheet. So if we take a look at the illustration I showed you previously, we can see that this is a database that consists of a table. And the table has information in rows and columns. So these rows are horizontal, Okay, so these are all rows, they are, they are horizontal and they represent unique records in a table. The columns or fields are in blue and they are vertical. So age, city, address, last name and first name can be referred to as columns or fields in a table. While the rows here are referred to as records. So each record should be unique in a table. Next, I want to introduce you to the concept of a relational database. A relational database basically is a database where two or more tables are 
related. So I'm going to show you a quick illustration. So this is an illustration where we have several tables in the database. So this customers is one table, orders is one table, order items is another table, products is another table. So with the relational database, there must be relationship between two or more tables. If we take a look at the customers table here, we've got a customer ID, which is a column or a field in the customers table. We've also got a customer ID here, which is also a field or a column in the orders table. So you can see the dot representing the relationship because there's a customer ID there and there's a customer ID there. All right, if we look at this order items table and this order table, we've got an order ID, we've got an order ID. You can see the dot here representing the relationship. Likewise, we've got a table called products. You can see that we've got a product ID and we've also got a product ID in this order item. So you can see the dot here representing the relationship between the tables. Next, we're going to look at what a relational database management system is, also referred to as RDBMS for short. A relational database management system is basically a software that is used to manage databases. So there are several types of relational database management system depending on the vendor. Examples include Oracle, Microsoft, SQL Server, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and many others. Next, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of a primary key. A primary key basically is used to uniquely identify each record in a database. Most primary keys must contain unique values. That means a primary key cannot contain null value. A null value basically is a value that is not represented, is unknown. So there must be a record that identifies each record uniquely in a database table. Also, a table can have only one primary key, which can consist of a single or multiple fields. So again, looking at this illustration of a table, we can see here that where we've got PK, PK represents a primary key. We're using the customer ID as a primary key to identify each record in the table. In this table, there we're using the order ID as a primary key. The next concept is a foreign key. A foreign key basically is a key that is used to link two tables together. So a foreign key can also be a collection of fields in one table that refers to the primary key in another table. So again, using this illustration here, we've got um, in this table, for example, we've got customer ID as a primary key, while in this table called orders, we've got customer ID as the foreign key. So the table that contains the foreign key is called the child table. And the table containing the um, primary key is, is called the parent table. So in this case, the customer ID here, where we've got the primary key, is a parent table, while the customer ID here, where we've got the foreign key, is the child table. The next concept I want to introduce you to is constraints. Constraints basically are used to specify the rules you want your data to follow in a table. And when you are setting up constraints, you can actually implement it at the point of 
creating the table. So when you're creating a table, you can also implement different types of constraint. Uh, an example constraint you could implement, for example, in any of the fields, you could say you don't want the value to be null. Null basically means that a value that is not known. Say, for example, here, I can specify that the customer last name, I can place a constraint in this field and say the customer last name um, cannot be null. That means they must provide a name for the customer name. Without that, it will not allow the input for that column. So that's basically what a constraint means. There are different types of constraints you can use to specify different types of rules you want your data to follow in a table. So any data you input, you want a set of rules for that data to comply with. So that's it for this video. In this video, I introduced you to some key and basic database concepts. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to the introduction to this section which is the Postgres CRUD operations. CRUD basically is an acronym for create, read, update, and delete. A lot of the times the operations you will perform on a Postgres database will be to create, to read, to update, and to delete. You also obviously need to add records and you do that with the insert command as well. But CRUD stands for create, read, update and delete. So we'll be performing these operations in this section. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you'll learn how to create a database using the PG4 admin tool. To access the admin tool, you need to go to all programs if you're on a Windows and locate the Postgres folder. If you expand that, the PG admin 4 tool is located inside that folder. So click to launch the tool. Give it a few minutes to launch. When the admin tool loads up, just click to expand the servers and click on the Postgres server. Once you click on that, it will give you an option to log in. So if you can just enter the password that you entered during the installation of the Postgres server. Click OK and it should give you access. It tells you server connected on the bottom right. So now to create a database, we just right click on this databases folder here and click on create and then database. It should give you a dialog box to enter some details. You need to enter the database name. I'm going to call mine fruits. And you can put a comment if you want. I'm just going to say database of fruits. And that's basically it. If you click save, it should create the database. Give it a few minutes. So the database has been created. That's the database here. When you create a database, it jumps to the top. So that's the database we've just created. So click on the plus sign to expand it so you can see more about the database. So these are all the objects that come with the database. This is a schema. If I expand that, um, it creates it under the public schema and it also creates other stuff so creates these other objects are created when you create a new database so we can check on the properties by clicking on this property icon there to see what the properties are and this is basically the properties of the 
database. So when you create a database, um, by default, there are certain things you enter, others can be completed for you. Um, like these here grayed out, there's the security option here. So none of that was completed. The definition was um, inserted for you. Um, this is the encoding. By default, it gives you this table space. Collation indicates the language you're using. So I'm in the UK, so it's put that there. Template, it says, no, I'm not using any template. Allow connections, yes. You can also decide not to allow a connection if you create a database and you just want to use it for testing purposes and you don't want any connection while you are doing some tests. Other things you can check, you can check, click on the SQL to see this is the SQL that was actually generated when you create a database. So if I was to create a database using SQL or SQL, this is how I would create it. From the information I provided, it has generated a SQL for the database. So this is a SQL used to create the database. Um, click on statistics. There shouldn't be that much. Um, so these are various statistics relating to the database. Um, dependencies, there shouldn't be. Dependents, there's no dependents. So you can also access the property page by right clicking on the database itself and going properties. Once you're in the properties, you can also click on the definition. These, are, this was the only information we completed during the um, creation of the database. The definition part was actually inserted for us by this tool. So all this here, we didn't do it. The tool inserted it for us automatically and security. If at some point you want to implement security on the database, this is where you implement the security. So you have to be a guarantor to add privileges. And then this is where you grant the users parameters. If you've got the parameters, this is where you add it. Default privileges. If there's any, this is where it will be. And the SQL here tells you nothing has changed from the SQL that was used to generate or the SQL that was generated when the database was created. So that's basically how you create a database using the PG admin 4 tool. Many thanks and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you will learn how to create a table using PG 4 admin. Open up your PG Admin 4 tool. I've already opened mine and I'm already logged into the server. So to create a table, there must be a database already in presence. So you create a table inside a database. So the database I'm going to create a table on is this database called Fruits. I create, we created this, um, database earlier. So I'm just going to expand this database and look for the schema. This is a schema inside the schema, which is called public. There are tables, although there's no tables at the moment, but this is where you create tables from. So to create a table, you right click on tables, which is under this fruits database and click on create and then table. And it should give you an option to enter the table name. So I'm going to call my table oranges. And it tells you the owner is Postgres. The schema is public. You can select a table space if you want. Um, if once you've done, just click save and it should create the table name. So you can see here, that's the table oranges. We've now created a table so we can go back to the table, right click and go properties and we can add more bits to the table. We can add columns. So to add columns, we click on that. 
And before we do that, let me click on the general tab. You can see it's um, created it in the default pd underscore default table space. So let's go to columns and let's start adding the tables and the columns. It gives you option to, you can inherit from tables. If you've got other tables, you can inherit um, columns from tables, gives you that option. But I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna create new columns. So click on this plus sign here to create a column. So with tables, they store data in columns and rows. So I'm going to call this category ID. And I'm going to select the data type, which it has to be an integer because it's going to be a number. So I'll select integer, uh, leave this to blank. And I'll select, do I want it to accept null value? No, I want there to be a value. So I say yes. Do I want to make it a primary key? Yes, I want it to be the primary key. So this um, column here, all the records in this column will be unique. So that is the first column. So I click to save it and I can add more columns. I go back. Go into properties, I wait for it to load, and then I go to columns again, and I click on the plus sign, give me another arrow. So I, at this time, I'm going to add a name, and I'm going to make the character varying character. So I'll type in character varying, so it'll be a varying character. You can give it a length, I'm going to give it 25 for the name. I don't expect there will be any fruit that will have more than 40, 25 characters of name. Um, again, I want there to be a name. I don't want that value to be empty. So I say, yes, I want it to be a null value. I want, I don't want any null value. Null middle means there is no, you don't know. So, you know, but you, by making this yes is forcing you to enter a name for the category. So I click save. I can, I'm going to add one more. I go right click again and go properties. Wait for it to load and I'm going to columns and click on the plus sign. I'm going to make this color. So I want to find out the color of the fruits. Again, I'll make this varying character varying, um, I make it 25 as well. Um, I'll leave this, this, so this can be empty if you're not sure what color the fruit is. So I don't want to enforce that. So I leave that option open. So if people are not sure what color it is, I want that left blank or null. I'll click save. So we've now created a table with three columns. If I expand this, you can see the columns of the table. So these are the columns. It tells you here three column. There are other things you can apply to the table. If I go on the properties, for example, you can give it a, you can apply constraints. Um, you notice because I've added a primary key to one of the table it's made that a constraint. Constraint basically in a way is kind of like a check. It forces you, it means you you can't progress unless you enter something in that um, in that field. Okay, so there are other options here: advanced parameters, security. You can add security to a table, so you can give access or restrict access. If you want to do that, this is the area you will be doing that. And the SQL basically tells you nothing has changed since the table was created. So if you want to see the SQL that was used to create the table, all you need to do once, let me cancel out of this. I click save. So if you want to see the SQL or the SQL, you right click on the name of the table and where it's got scripts, just click on create. And that would generate a script with the um, 
create command so there you go so this is a script that you would use if you were to create it without um, that is not with the table not from within the admin tool so this basically is the SQL or the script um, used to this script is, was generated when you created the table so if I wasn't going to use the admin tool I wanted to use SQL or SQL this would be the SQL I would use to create the table so that's it for this lecture on creating a table using the PG4 admin tool many thanks for watching and bye for now hello and welcome to this lecture in this lecture you will learn how to use the Postgres create table statement to create a table in a database let's take a look at a typical syntax to create a table so this is what a typical syntax looks like to create a table you begin with the create table command followed by the name of the table and then in between the parentheses you specify the names of the columns the table will contain a table can have as many columns as you wish to specify so once you specify the name of the table you then begin to define or specify the names of the column so you start with a column name followed by the data type if it's going to be an, an integer which is a number or a text and there are different types of textual data type so you need to insert that and then if you want a constraint on the column you also need to add that a constraint basically is um, a condition that you apply to a column for example you can add to a column that you don't want that column to be empty there must be a value that is a kind of constraint so let's go over to our pg4 admin editor and create a table i have already logged into the pg4 admin tool so i'm just going to expand the list of databases when you're creating table you need to create it in the correct database and schema so i've got three databases listed here the database I want to create a table on is this one here called fruits so I'm going to expand that and then expand the schema and you should see one for tables there's only one table there so what I need to do I need to access the query editor so I right click and go query tool you can also access the query tool from the tools option and click on query tool so I have now got my query tool open so this is where I'm going to define my table as you can see here in the editor it says fruits on Postgres so it knows that I am in the fruits database which is this database here so that's where I'm creating the table in so I'll start with the create table command followed by the name I want to call the table I'll call it berries and then I have to enclose parentheses and then I put my mouse in between the parentheses and expand it so in between this parenthesis is where I'll define the columns for the table so the first column I'm going to define is going to be the ID so I'm going to type in berry underscore ID I'm going to make that the primary key
a primary key basically is a column or a group of columns that is used to identify a row that is unique in a table. If you are adding more columns, you put a comma at the end of the first column and then you tap to the next line and then add another column. So I'm going to type in very underscore name. Again, I need to specify the data type this time. It's going to be a voucher data type that will accept, that can allow 255 characters. And I'm going to set a constraint A constraint basically means that um, you are applying some kind of restriction or a rule to that column. What not 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 means that there must be a value in this column. That is, it cannot be empty. For illustration purposes, I'm just going to leave it with two columns. But you know, you just you get the idea. You can add as many columns as you wish to in a table. But for this table, I'm just going to make it really simple and just leave it at two um, column. So I want it to, don't want it to be a two column table for now. Once you're done, you need to put a semicolon at the end to indicate that you are done with creating the table. You can always add columns later when the table has been created. Once you're done, you can now execute the query to create the table by clicking on this here. So once you've executed, it tells you that query returns successful. So successfully created the table, it tells you the command you used. Um, notice that um, I've added a data type. You must always have a data type when you're creating a column so that um, the column knows what type of data to expect. So here, after the name of the column, you need to add the data type. This is an ID column, which is going to be, it's going to be an integer, which is a number. So this INT means integer. So that's the data type for this column. So basically this is the a simple format that you can use to create a table. You can make it as simple as this one or as complex, whereby you can also add a constraint to several columns within a table, or and you can also add constraint to the table itself. So let's quickly query this table that um, we've just created to see if we can communicate with it. So I'm going to quickly um, write a select statement. I'll do select star from berries. It's very important to um, always just check what you've done just to make sure everything checks out. Okay. So I'm highlighting that and I click. So you can see it's successful. It tells you we've got two columns in this table tells you the data type, but there is no data inside the table. So we've got the table structure all in place, waiting for data input. Thank you for watching. And I hope the lecture has been useful. So this is how you create a table using Postgres create table command. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you will learn how to insert new rows into a database table using the insert command. Sometimes when you create a new table in a database, it is bare, it doesn't have any data. In order to add data, you need to use the Postgres insert statement to insert 
data or rows of data into the table. A typical syntax to insert data or rows into a table is like this. You begin with the insert into clause followed by the name of the table and then in parentheses you specify the column names. If the table has got two columns you specify the two columns and then you add the values. The values um, basically is where you specify the data you're trying to insert and the values must match the column and also in the order. So these are the columns you want to insert data or row into. You specify that first and then in the values you have to separate each of the values by a comma. The value list must be in the same order as a column list specified after the table name which is this one. So if I've got column 1 which is an integer, column 2 which is a string, the in the value list it must correspond or must match, must be in the same order. I can't have a data type here of integer and then here I have a data type of string. It will not work. So the the format, the column names and the values you enter must match. If this is an integer, the value I'm entering here must reflect that and so on. When you're inserting or adding rows to a table, you can add one row at a time or you can insert multiple values. So let's see how this works. So I've logged into my PG4 admin tool. I'm going to expand the databases. I've got three databases here. The database I'm going to use is the fruits database. And if I go to the schema here, within the schema I've got a public schema and then I've got the tables. This database has got two tables, oranges and berries. So I want to insert some rows, some data into the berries table. So what I can do, I right click where it's got berries and then I'll click on the query tool. Okay, I can either do that or if I want to save time, I can go to scripts and click on insert script. So that will add some of the script for me. All I need to do is make some modifications. So by doing it by the script option, it saves me a bit of time. So it has kindly insert, done the insert for me, so I don't need to add that again. It's also done, added the public, which is the name of the schema. And then it's added the name of the table, which is berries. So the dot separates the table name from the schema name. And you can see the parentheses here, that's the opening parentheses. And this is the closing parentheses. And you see it's identified the name of my columns. Berry underscore ID is put that in there for me. And Berry underscore name is put that in for me. It, it can't do the values because it doesn't know what values I'm trying to add. So this, you notice that each of the values have been separated by a comma. So all I need to do, I know that berry ID is an integer, so it must take a number. So I'll put number one there. If I put anything other than a number, it will not work because I'm trying to enter the wrong data type into um, a column that does not accept um, a non-integer data type. And in here, if I do the same, if I enter an integer, it will complain. So what I need to do is enter the correct data type. So I'm going to type in strawberry. And do that. Because it's a string, I need to enclose the values in quotes. And then you end that with a semicolon. 
Now let me execute and hopefully it should insert the record. If I click on this here, the execute option, and uh, we should see it says query return successful. So query return, so it has inserted. So let's quickly check by typing in a quick select statement. So I do select star from berries. Berries is the name of the table and I execute. Ooh, doesn't like it. Arrow, duplicate key. All right, that's worked. The reason I had an error is that um, because I didn't select this and I was trying to run the query, what it's trying to do was trying to run both queries. It was trying to run this and it was trying to run this. So it was erroring because it thinks I'm trying to add the same data I've already added. So when you are, when you have multiple script in the editor and you want to execute only a particular one, it's probably best to just highlight that one so the editor doesn't get confused. So as you can see now, I've now got a record in our table called berries. That's the ID, that's the name. In some databases, you can um, set the primary key or this column here, an ID column, you can set that to auto increase. What that means that you can set up what is known as a sequence. So each time you add a record, it automatically, you know, increases you. You don't have to manually add this column. It will auto increase for you. All right, we've learned how to insert a single rec record, which is what I've done here. So now we're going to insert multiple records. So again, the query is the same. The only difference here is that I've added this to, I'm inserting multiple records. So the values has to match the columns. So I've got berry ID, which is um, an integer column. So this is the values for that. So I add the, the berry ID will be this and the berry name will be that. The second value will be three and this will be blueberry. I just need to change the name. I've got, I didn't change that. I just changed that to black berries and I'll change this to wraps, wraps berries. Okay, so now if I execute this, I just highlight it. It should insert three extra records. It tells you that. Okay, so now I've got three extra records inserted. I come here, I run this select statement, I highlight it and click. You can see these are all the records. Now you can see this one, two, three, four. So that's how you insert records or data into a table. Notice that in production live databases where you have an integer column, normally that is auto populated with a sequence. So you don't necessarily have to manually add this column here. You just add a sequence and the sequence we auto insert the next value for you. So that is it for this lecture on inserting records into a table. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'll be introducing you to Postgres select statement. One of the most common tasks you will perform when working with Postgres is the task of querying data from tables and you do that by using a SELECT statement. So the SELECT statement is basically used to query data from a table. The SELECT statement can be very basic or you can make it complex by combining it with several clauses. So you can use it in combination with other clauses to make the SELECT statement more complex and powerful.
there are several ways you can build a select statement but let's have a look at the basic syntax you can use a syntax basically refers to how something is written so for a very basic syntax or a very basic select statement you can specify the column for example a table stores data stores data in columns and rows just like in an excel spreadsheet if you wanted to query data from a table you have an option rather than rather than query all the data you may want specific data to query so you can do that by selecting the columns individually and specifying the table where the data is coming from and the way you will write that statement is this you do a select which is a select keyword select indicates you are trying to retrieve data select doesn't cause any damage to the database there's no risk because all you're trying to do is read data so you start with the word with the keyword select followed by the columns you want to retrieve data from say you have a table that has maybe 20 columns and you only want to retrieve data for two columns rather than retrieve everything and then sift through what you want you can specify the actual columns you want to retrieve data from this also helps save um, network traffic rather than pulling all the data from a table you only pull down the specific data you need so i'm you assume you want to retrieve data from column one and column two from a table that has 20 columns so you just specify column one and then you separate each column by a comma okay so i i, I want tape i want to retrieve data from column one comma and then column two you don't need to put a comma at the last column because there's only two if you were to add another column then yes you put a column after the two but not with the last column and then you need the from the from is very important because the query needs to know where it's pulling that data from so the from is used to specify the name of the table the other way you can write a select statement is if you wanted to retrieve all the data from a table so you want all the columns and all the rows you don't want to be specific you just want to get everything out of that table the way you specify that statement is this you do a select keyword for followed by the asterisk symbol that asterisk symbols indicates that you want to retrieve all the data from all the columns and all the rows you also have to specify a from field which indicates the name of the table the data is coming from so these are the two basic ways you can write a select statement these are just basic you can obviously make it more complex by adding other clauses to it but at the very basic um, this is what a select statement looks like. This is how you would write it. Um, you can also obviously make the select statement more complex by adding things, other keywords or clauses to make the query more complex. But in a very basic select statement, this is how you would specify it. So that is it for this lecture. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I will be introducing you to the WHERE clause. The WHERE clause basically is used to act as a filter to filter rows that are returned from a SELECT statement. Without the WHERE clause in a statement, it can return all the data you have specified so the where clause acts as a filter to filter out 
um, the records that are returned from a select query statement based on certain conditions or criteria you have specified inside the where clause. So let's look at how you write a where clause. So the syntax basically is this. You, after your select statement, after you key in this keyword, you've done your column select. If you're selecting specific column, if not, if you're selecting all the column, then you can replace the column names with asterisk. You specify the name of the table and then the where clause. The where clause usually um, appears after the from. Okay, so you you must place it after the ta after the table name, which is after the from keyword. Then you place the where clause. Inside the where clause, you specify the conditions that must be met for the returned data from the query. All right. Say, for example, you can specify that you want to return data from column one, column two, from this table where maybe the first name begins with this or setting conditions matches a setting criteria. So the where clause will also will be acting as a condition. If the condition you specified in the where clause is met, then the relevant data is returned. So let's illustrate how this where clause is used. So I've logged into my PG admin four, and these are the tables from this DVD rental database, the sample database here. And I'm just going to pick a table to work on. Um, I've got a table here called customer. So let me quickly right click on this table and go to the properties so we can see the properties of the table. So this should reveal things like the columns of the table. So if I click here now, we can see these are all the columns of the table. So let me run a quick query on the table. I'm just going to right click and go query tool. I'll wait for the query tool to launch and then I'll write a very quick select statement. So I'm going to do a select star from from customer, which is this table here. And that should, if I execute this, that will give me, it will return all the data. You can see 599 rows retrieved. All right. So say, for example, I don't want all this data retrieved. It has received 599 rows. And if I don't want all 599 rows returned, I can apply a filter. Okay. And the filter will reduce the amount of records returned. At the moment, it has returned 599 rows. You can see here saying 599. So I want to apply a filter here. So to do that, I'm going to get rid of this semicolon there and type in the where clause. So this is a where clause that will act as a filter. Then I need to specify the condition for the where clause. So I'm going to say where the store store underscore ID. Notice here we've got store ID one. Some of them are store ID two. So I'm going to say where the store ID is equals to two. I've now applied a filter. So the data that's going to be returned from this query should be less than 599 records because I'm using this fil filter here to restrict it. So I only want to return data that matches the store ID number two. Anyway, where the store ID is two, those are the data I want returned. So notice I've used an equals to here. Equals to is known as a comparison operator. So that's what we use to compare. 
okay so if I run this now just watch out it should return less than 599 so let me execute that look out here it says 273 rows retrieved so we've been able to filter the rows that have been returned using this query here so the where clause here acts as a filter and you can specify any condition inside the where clause so whatever condition you specify in the where clause when the query is executed it will compare that condition and based on the condition you've specified it will return the data that matches that criteria so that's how you use a where clause to act as a filter thanks for watching and bye for now the where clause is also important when you are deleting records so you can use the where clause to act as a filter so you don't delete all the records from a table inside the where clause you can specify what you want to delete or what you want to update very important the where clause bye for now hello and welcome to this lecture in this lecture we are going to learn how to query data from all the columns within a table to query data from a table is quite easy if you want to query all the data and the syntax you use is this very basic and simple you just type in the select keyword followed by the asterisk symbol the asterisk symbol basically means retrieve all the columns and all the rows from a table you need to specify a from keyword which indicates where you're getting the data from so let's go ahead and do that let's log into our pg admin tool so go to all programs if you're on the windows click on the postgres folder and click on pg admin 4 if you're on a mac look for the pg admin 4 icon and click to launch uh, once it launches we need to connect to the database and then begin writing the query once it launches click on the plus sign on the left here to expand the server it tells, it tells you you've only got the one server click on the plus sign here and you should get a prompt to sign in so enter your password this will be the password set during the postgres installation Ooh, looks like i've got mine wrong let me try again okay i mean this time it tells you server connected on the bottom there so let me expand the databases the database we are going to use for this lecture is the sample dvd rental database this one here so i'm going to click on the plus sign if i click on the plus sign it should tell me here database connected on the bottom right so i'm connected to the database you can see the dashboard here i need to expand the schema we've only got the one schema which is public so i click on the plus sign and that should reveal all the objects within that database so the tables this is where i'm where what i'm interested in let's expand the tables so these are all the tables for this sample database here and i'm going to go for the customers table this time so i want to query all the data from this table um, before i do that i just want to check the properties of the table i'm just going to right click on the table and go properties and it's trying to retrieve data from the server let's give it a few minutes to do that okay so it tells us here name of the table is customer the owner of the table is postgres schema is public the table space where it stores this data is pg underscore default so let's check the columns here we can see these are all the columns of the table and i want to retrieve 
data from all this column. I'm not going to be specific of which column I want the data from. I want the data from all the columns. So I want all the columns and all the records. So I'm just going to click exit. Next thing I want to do is access the query to. So I'm going to right click on this table here called customer and click on query tool and that will launch the tool I can use to write the query. So give it a few minutes. We now have our query tool here. I'm just going to drag that. The output will be in, will be displayed in this area here. So to type the build the query, you type in select. SQL is case insensitive, so you can write select in lower case if you wish. Doesn't really matter. So I do select followed by the asterisk. Asterisk indicates that I want everything all the columns, all the records from the columns and rows. And then I specify the name of the table. I like to write the keywords in capitals so that they stand out. You, and if you notice also the keywords are also colored, makes them stand out. So from is where I'll specify the name of the table, which is customer and then a semicolon. Semicolon is important, always good in case you have several statements inside the editor window. Um, the semicolon indicates the end of one statement. So it's a good practice to always end your statements with a semicolon. So what this query is saying basically is get all the records from the customer's table. This asterisk means retrieve all records from all columns. So let's execute that by clicking on this lightning bolt here. And it's trying to do that. And it tells you here 599 rows retrieved. So this is everything from this table called customers. All right. So you can see all the columns on top and these are all the records. Okay. From this table, it's 100, 669 it says. Okay. So we've got everything all the data that's ever been saved into this table, we have captured it using this simple statement. So basically this is how you use the select statement to retrieve data from a column. If you use it with a select and the star, it gets every data from the table and displays it in the output. Many thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to learn how to query data from specific columns within a database table. The syntax we are going to use is this. Basically, we use the select keyword followed by the column names, and then we select the name of the table and enter it into the from field. So this here is the structure of how we would write a select statement to query data from specific columns within a table. We are going to be querying data from our sample database, which is the DVD rental sample database. So let's go ahead and open up our admin tool and begin. So let's launch our admin tool. Go to your start or programs. If you're on a Windows, if you're on a Mac, look for the Postgres folder and make sure you click to open the PG admin for and give that a few minutes to launch. And then we can try and connect to the Postgres server and access the database. So give it a few minutes, it should load. Once it loads, you need to expand the server option within the browser here. Click the plus. And once you expand, you need to click on this and you should have a prompt that you have to enter your password. So click on the plus sign. It will give you this prompt here. So enter the password. The password will be the password you would have set during the Postgres installation. So just enter that password in there. 
Once you've entered it, click OK. And you should now, it tells you server connected just on the bottom. So once you're connected to the server, you have access to all the databases and the objects. So I'm going to expand this databases option here. It says we have two databases. So we'll give it time to expand. The database we're going to interrogate or query is this sample database here called DVD rental. So click on the plus sign to expand the database objects. All right, so it tells you here database connected. So we need to expand the schema area and expand the public schema and get access to one thing that is good practice is before you query data from a table, it's always good to check the table structure. So the, this is the, these are the tables for the DVD rental here and the table we are going to query for this lecture is going to be, let's just pick a table. I'm going to query this table here called city. So I want to check the structure first so that I see um, how many columns it's got and so on. So I'm going to right click on the city here table and go properties. So when the property page opens up, it gives me the name of the table. It's called city. It tells me who owns the table. It's owned by this user here. The schema is public. Table space is this. So let's check the columns. This table has four columns. Um, this is the data. These are the data types. So we've got city ID, city country ID and last update. So what I'd be interested in from this table is the city column and the country ID. So I want the city and the country ID. So those are the two columns I want to query data from this table. So let me begin by writing the query for that. So I'm going to right click on this city here and click on the query tool. And that will give me the editor where I can write my query. So this is where I'm going to write my query. So I've already decided that there are two columns I need. I need the city. Let me expand these columns here so we can see them. So I need the city column and the country ID. So this is how I would specify the select query. I'll do select. SQL is case insensitive, so you can make it uppercase or lowercase. It will still work. So I'll do select the columns. So the first column will be city, comma, followed by country ID. Country underscore ID. And then the next will be the from. From will be the name of the table is called city. And this is basically the select statement completed. So I'm selecting, I'm querying data from specific columns here. The column from this city table here is the city, which is this column here, and the country ID, which is this one rather than get all the data, only one specific columns. And I've ended the statement with a semicolon. Notice the keywords here are highlighted, so you know that they are keywords, the select and the from. Now I'm going to execute the query and the output should show here. So click on this, that looks like a lightning bolt, Just click, or you can press F5 and it should execute the query. And so this is how it tells you total query runtime, 600 rows, retrieve. So this is basically the city and this is the country ID. All right. It tells you here, it shows the data type in and the, yeah, it shows you the data type and then the name of the columns. So that's the city here. This is, a, this is for example, this is a city called Abu Dhabi 
and the country ID is got 101. And if I scroll down, we can just pick another country. Uh, we've got Dallas here. We've got 103 city. These are all cities. And then these are the country IDs. So basically this is how you retrieve specific data from a table by selecting specific columns and then you query the data from those columns. So that's it for this lecture. Many thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture you will learn how to use the Postgres update statement to update existing data in a table. Let's have a look at a typical syntax. So this is what the syntax will look like to update data in a table. So you start with the update state with the update keyword, followed by the name of the table. This then you, you then you use the set keyword. This set is important because this is what activates the change. So you type in the word set followed by the column name you're trying to make the change on. Then you use the equals to sign. This equals to basically is what you use to change the value. So after the column name, you set the new value. If you're changing more than one column, then you separate the first column with a comma. And then you do the same for the second column. If you're adding more than two column, again, a comma and so on. And then you specify a where condition. The where is important. The where acts as a filter to prevent you from updating any other records in the table. So the condition you specify in the where clause is important because that enables that only the columns that match the condition in the where clause will be updated. So let's see how this works. I've logged into the PG4 admin and the database I'm going to use to illustrate is a database called Fruits and it's inside the public schema. And the table I'm going to update is this table here called Berries. So I'm going to right click on the Berries table. One advantage of using this PG4 tool. It makes things a lot easier for you. So rather than me writing the script from scratch, I can just go here where it says script and select update. And it will begin writing some of these scripts for me. All I need to do is just make some modifications. So basically this is what it's done. It's saying this is the update, update statement. Um, the public refers to the schema. Berries refers to the name of the table. So this is what I'm doing is asking me what am I changing? So set here is what I need to specify what data I'm changing. So this indicates the name of the column. So I am going to, before you make any modification to a table, it's always best to see what the table contains first. So I'm going to do a quick select statement. Do a select star from berries. Where you've got more than one statement in the editor, it's best to highlight what you're trying to execute so that the editor doesn't get confused. That's one of the reasons you should always have a semicolon after each statement. Notice I have an error and the editor puts a dot where he thinks I've got the error. That's because I've got the name of my table wrong. So I've got a missed out an extra R. So I just type that in and I'll run the query again. All right, so this is what, this is the content of the table. I'm trying to make some updates on. And when you are making update, um, the process is the same, whether you're making updates to one or several columns in a table. All right, say I want to make some modification to this 
here called strawberries. I want to change the name of the strawberry. I want to add some extra text. Uh, I just want to add strawberries and then followed by the word UK. Um, just to indicate that the strawberries come from UK. So the way I would do that is in the set area, I will get rid of the ID because I'm not changing the ID. What I am changing is the um, name. Okay, so I'm going to say set berry name. That's the name of this column. I'm going to set it. And then I need an equals to sign to indicate the new value I'm going to give it. I'm going to call it strawberry strawberries UK so I've added the word UK next to the strawberries if I was to do that for if I didn't include this where clause here what that will do it will update all the all the strawberry everything here we'll update this to strawberries uk that to strawberries uk and this to strawberries uk the where clause uh, prevents that happening this is very important because if you're in a production environment and you have thousands of records if you don't include the where condition it will just update everything and that could be disastrous so the where clause is very important so i've set i've used the set keyword to indicate where i want to make the change so i'm changing the berry name which is this here to strawberries uk in the where condition is where i need to attach the condition so i will now say where berry underscore ID is equals to one. So what that means, it will only change the or update the records where this condition is true. You can see here the berry ID here is one. So that means if I run this script, it will not affect the other records. So let's give that a go. I just select that and click on this to execute. If all goes well, it tells you query returned successfully. If I run this select statement again, you will notice the change has been made. You can see now it's now updated this to strawberries UK. So that's how you perform an update statement on a table. The process is the same, whether you are updating one record or a thousand records. The key thing to take away here, you must not forget to include the where clause. If you don't include the where clause in an update, the update applies to the entire column in the table. So it's very important you use the where clause to prevent errors from happening or to prevent disastrous situations. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you'll learn how to use the Postgres delete statement to delete rows of a table. So if you wanted to remove a record or a row from a table, you need to use the delete command or statement to achieve that. Let's have a look at a typical syntax for a delete statement. So this is how you would structure a statement. You start with a keyword delete, and then you use the from to indicate the name of the table. And then you add a filter with the where condition. When you're deleting records or rows from a table, if you don't use the where condition or where filter, it will wipe out everything from that table. So it's very important to use the where clause to act as a filter to protect other records in the table. So let's have a look at, at how we'll implement this. I have logged into my PG admin for tool and the database I'm going to use to illustrate is the fruits database. This database here and the, the table is in the public schema. 
and the table I'm going to use is this table here called berries. So to make things a lot easier, I'm going to use the built-in um, script in the in this PG admin to save me time. So I'm going to right click and go script. So different kind of scripts you can use here. I'm just going to say I want to delete and it will write a delete script for me. All I need to do is make some modifications to that script. So basically it starts with the keyword delete and then from the schema and then the table name. This is where you specify the condition. Before you perform a delete, it's always best sometimes to check this table, what's in the table first. So I'll do select star from berries. I'm just going to highlight that and click execute so I can see the data in the table before I make any deletion. So let's say I want to delete this record here called strawberries UK. The way I will achieve that is in the where condition, I just come here. When you're deleting, make sure you've got the right table. Um, by do using the script option from the PG admin, it just makes things a lot easier for you. Although you can also manually um, write that, it just saves you time. So I'm deleting from the berries table, which belongs to the public schema. So I'm deleting where is where I specify the condition. Uh, so when you delete, you actually delete a record, a line, all these are all records. So I'm deleting where the berry underscore ID is equals to one. That is basically the condition. If I didn't have this where clause and I just say delete from public berries, it can wipe out all the records from the table. So you can imagine if he had millions of records or thousands, he wiped them out. So the where clause is very important. What that means, it will only delete records that matches this criteria where the berry ID, berry underscore ID is one. So let's run that and we can see what it does. Execute, tells me it's returned, so it's done the job. So if I run this again, there shouldn't be any record for strawberry. All right, so you can see it has record one no longer exists where you've got berry underscore ID one. It has, it has um, removed that record from the table. So the process is the same, whether you're deleting one record or you're deleting a thousand records. The key thing to take away here is that you must always use the where clause. If you do not use a where clause when you're deleting, it can cause um, catastrophic issues by removing records you didn't intend to remove. Very important to specify the where clause in your delete statement. That's it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you will learn to use subquery to build complex SQL query. A subquery basically is a query nested inside another query. And this can be with a select statement, an update statement, and also an insert statement. To construct a subquery, the second query is placed inside brackets. And also you have the where clause used as an expression in the subquery. So a subquery basically is an SQL statement that has another SQL statement embedded in the where or in the having clause. So let's look at a typical syntax. This is what a syntax will look like. So this portion here where you've got the 
brackets that's this bracket here and this one here in between this is known as the inner query so this here is the embedded query it is known as the inner query while this portion here this part of the query here is known as the outer query so I've changed the color to make it more pronounced so the part in yellow here is known as the outer query while the query in green which has brackets around it is known as the inner query all right let's start with a very simple example so I've got a simple query here where I'm selecting the rental rate from this film this is a film table and this is the column I'm selecting and I'm applying a AVG, which is an aggregate function to this column here called rental rate, which is this column there. So suppose we want to find the films whose rental rate is higher than the average rental rate. So we do this, we can do this in two steps. First, we find the average rental rate by using the select statement and the average function which I've specified here. The second step is to use the result from the first query in the second select statement to find the films that we want. So let's execute this so we can see the result. All right, so let me just expand that a bit. So this is the result from this query so approximately is 2.98 so which means the average rental rate is 2.98 now we can get the films whose rental rate is higher than the average rental rate so i've implemented this query here this query you can see to to find the films whose rental rate is higher than the average rental rate. You can see here I've used the greater than sign. So I've said select the film ID, title and rental rate from this film table where the rental rate is higher than 2.98. 2.98 was the average we found. So let me run this so we can see what it outputs. So this is the output from this query. You can see these are the rental rates. The way the code is implemented at the moment is not that elegant. So what we can do, we can make it elegant in two steps and we'll do that by implementing a sub query. So what we want to do, we want to, we want a way to pass the result of the first query to the second query in one query using a sub query. So I've re modified the query here to make it look more elegant and it implemented a subquery. So a subquery basically is a query nested inside another query. So what I've done here, I've started with a select statement and picked out the columns from the film table. And in the where clause, I have applied some conditions so I've said where the rental rate is greater. Okay, so it will output this result first and use that report, that result of this first query and use it for the second query. So where rental rate is greater and then it, this is where the second query starts from. So this is select and I've applied an AVG to the rental rate from the film so the second query is nested inside the first you can see the brackets as the opening brackets and that's the closing brackets so the query inside the bracket is what is called a subquery or an inner query the query that contains the subquery is known as the outer query Postgres executes 
the query that contains a subquery in the following sequence. First, it executes the subquery, okay, which is this query here. Second, it gets the results and then pass it to the outer query. Third, it executes the outer query. So the, way, the format in which Postgres executes, first of all, it will execute the sub query, all right, which is the inner query, the query that contains the, the query in the brackets. This, this is the brackets here. So this query here is what is known as the sub query or inner query. Why this here is known as the outer query. That is a query that contains the sub query. So when the code executes, the, it will execute the sub query first, which is this query. And once that query is executed, it will use the result from this query and pass it on to this outer query here. And the third, then the outer query uses that result and executes it. So let me execute so you can see. All right, so this is what the output looks like. A subquery can also return zero or more rows. So this is just a simple illustration of how to implement a subquery. You can also use other operators when you are implementing subqueries. For example, you can use the subquery with an in operator and also with an exist operator. Many thanks for watching. I hope it has been useful. Please do let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to learn how to remove duplicate records using the distinct keyword. There may be times where a select statement may return several or multiple duplicate records and you may want to reduce the duplicates. And the way you achieve that is by including the distinct keyword in your select statement. Let's have a look at the syntax to create a distinct statement. So this is what you do basically. You include the keyword distinct inside your select statement, followed by the column names you want to apply the distinct to. And obviously you still have to use a from to indicate the tables coming from. You can order the data after the distinct has been applied and you can order by either in ascending order or descending order. So let's have a look at how this works. So log into your PG admin four. I've already logged in. Um, and once you've logged in, select the DVD rental database. Just click on the plus sign to expand the database objects. And it should tell you the database is connected. Expand the schema and click on the public schema. Let's expand the tables. So these are all the tables for that sample database, 15 of them in total. Before we go ahead and remove the duplicate, I want to run a quick query that will show the duplicate entries. So the table I'm going to go for here is this table called inventory. So if I click on the plus sign, you can see all the columns from that table. There's only one, two, three, four. The column I am interested in is this column here called film ID. So right click on the name of the table and go query tool. It will launch the query editor. So I'm going to write just a very simple select statement. And I'm going to select just one column here, which is this film ID column. So I'm going to select film ID. 
film underscore ID from the table name is called inventory and a semicolon to end the statement. So now let me execute by clicking on this icon here that looks like a lightning bolt. If I click on that, it will output the query. So you can see all these duplicates here. These are all duplicate entries. You can see one, 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 two. So there's a lot of duplicate entries. You see several fours and so on. So this is what I want to get rid of. And the way I do that is to add a distinct keyword to the select statement. So I just come here and type in distinct. Oh, I got it wrong. Just remove the I, remove the, that's it. You can see the color has changed as well because it's a keyword. If I now execute this query, these duplicates will be gone. It will only show me one instance of each. All right, so I'll execute that again, and you should see that the duplicates are gone. What I want to do also is add, I want to order it. So I include an order by. I'm going to order by the film ID. And I'm going to order it in ascending order. That is from A to Z. If I run this again, it will filter the data. You can see now the data has been returned and it's filtered. There's no duplicates. You can see I've got one, two, three, four, and so on, but the duplicate entries have been removed. So that's basically how you use the distinct keyword to get rid of duplicate records in a table. So that's it for this lecture. Many thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to learn how to sort data returned by a select statement. So we are going to use the order by clause inside our select statement to activate the sorting of the data returned. This is what the syntax will look like. So the format basically will start with a select keyword. We will select specific columns from a table and then apply the order by clause in order to sort the data returned from the select query. So let's launch our PG admin four tool by going to all programs. If you're on the windows, click on the Postgres folder and then PG admin four. If you're on a Mac, also locate the PG admin four icon and click to launch the icon. Once the tool launches, let's connect to the server by clicking on the server plus here. And then if you click on the Postgres server, it should give you an option to log in. So click on the plus sign and we just need to enter the password. So the password will be the password set during the installation of Postgres. So I'm connected. It tells you here server connected on the bottom right. So let's access the database. Um, we have two databases here. The database we are going to run this query on is the DVD rental database. So I'm going to expand that. It tells you here database connected. So let me expand the schema and then the public schema. And let's look for the table. And these are the tables for that database. We got 15 tables and the table I'm going to query here is the country table. Country, no, I'll go for the customer, sorry. I'm going to query the customer's table. So if I expand that, you can see all the columns from this customer table. Let me just expand this a bit so you can see. So these are the columns from the customer table. I'm going to select specific columns here. I'm going to select the first name and the last name column only. 
So let me open the query window by right clicking on the table name and clicking on query tool that will launch the query editor from where we can build the query. So this is a query editor. The query will be outputted in this area here. I'm just going to drag that down a bit to create some more room. All right. So let's write the query here. The query I'm going to write will be a select. I'll start with the first name column, always specify the column the way it's been defined. So I'm going to do first name, underscore name. You use a comma to separate the column names. And then I've got the last name here and I'll type in last underscore name. And then I'll specify the from always good to write your keywords in capitals to make them stand out. The editor here also gives them a specific color to make them stand out. So in the from field is where you specify the name of the table, which is customer. And that is basically it. I'm not going to add include an order by yet. The reason being, I want to execute this query so you can see the difference when the data is sorted and when the data is not sorted. So I'm going to click on this icon here to execute. As you can see, this is the output from the query here. The data is not sorted in any way. You can see here, um, the first name here, you've got say Jared, you see Linda, you got Elizabeth. You've got Dorothy. So there's the data is not kind of like, it's not ordered in a way. So it is returned the way the data was entered into the table. So we can change that by adding an order by clause. So the way it is now without using an order by clause, it sorts it in ascending order. So now I want to be specific and apply an order by clause. So to do that, when you are adding an order by to your statement to filter data, it's usually the last thing you, the last thing you add to the statement. So I'm just going to add an order by, I do order by, I'm going to order by the last name column here. So you can order by first name or last name. It doesn't really matter. But I'm going to order by last name. So I do, yeah, I do last name. Underscore name. And then I want it in a descending order. When you use the order by, you have to specify how you're ordering the data that is returned by the select statement, either in a descending order or ascending. This is the current structure here of the output. You can see um, Ellie Smith, there's no order here. You can see the A appears here, Anderson, and you can see J there. So by the time we run this query again, after adding the order by, this last name will be structured in the way it is sorted. You, you'll see a more structured ordering of this column here. So keep an eye on this column here. All right, so let's execute the query again. And we just see, as you can see, we've ordered the data in a descending order. That is from Z to A, if you will. You can see here, it displays Young first, um, Y. And then if I scroll down, you can see, you probably see if there's any A, it will be right at the bottom. Let's scroll down. You can see these are the A's because of the way I have ordered the data. All right. So if you're ordering in descending order, it will take the format of Z to A. If you're ordering in ascending order, it will be from A to Z. So if I change this, for example, from descending to ascending and run this again, it should change the structure. You can see now the ordering is different is from ascending means A to Z. You can see that now A appears first 
and so on. So that's how you sort data returned by a select statement. So if you don't specify the order by, the default is ascending. So when you are ascending, it takes it from, it sorts the data from A to Z. If you're using descending, it sorts the return data from Z to A. Many thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you will learn how to divide rows into groups by using the group by clause. The group by clause is used to divide the rows returned from a select statement into groups. Using the group by clause, you can apply aggregate functions to the columns. For example, you can apply aggregate functions like the sum to calculate the sum of the items, or you can add the count aggregate function to the columns. With the count, it enables you to get the number of items in a group. So let's look at the syntax for implementing a group by clause. So it's always implemented with a select statement. So you got the select, then you followed by the column name, then the aggregate function, and inside the parentheses for the aggregate function, you specify the column you are applying the aggregate function to. Then you select the table name from the from field, and then you apply a group by column. You then group the column by the column name after the aggregate function has been applied. What are aggregate functions? Aggregate functions are basically used to perform calculations on data. Aggregate function mostly returns a single value based on calculations from the columns. So the data returned by an aggregate function is a single value, but calculated from the values in a column. Let's have a quick look at a brief table showing some aggregate functions. So this is a brief table here of some common aggregate functions and their description. So we've got the AVG or average, it's used to return average value, the count, returns the number of rows, the max returns the largest value, the mean returns the smallest value, the sum returns the sum, the first and the last returns the first and the last values. So let me show you an illustration of how a group by clause works. So I'm going to use this DVD rental database. And this database has got 15 tables and I'm going to use one of them to illustrate. The table I'm interested in here is the payment table. So let's take a look at the columns. These are the columns in the table. So you've got the payment ID, customer ID, staff ID, rental ID, amount and payment date. You don't always have to use an aggregate function with a group by. You can use the group by clause without applying an aggregate function. So I'm going to show you an example where you don't have to use an aggregate function. So let me open up the query tool and I'm going to pick a few columns from this table here. So I'll start with a select statement. Type in the select keyword, followed by, I'm going to pick the customer ID. Comma, and then I'm going to, actually, I'm just only going to pick one column from now and then type in the from field. The from will be payment. Then I'm going to apply a group by. I'm going to group it by the customer ID.
on the score ID. So what this query will do, it will get data from the payment table and group the result by the customer ID. So let's run the query so we can see. Ooh, I've got an error there. The reason being, you can see these dotted lines. It means that it doesn't recognize that column. I've got it wrong. It should be customer underscore ID. So let me rectify that. All right, and then semicolon. Now it should work. Ooh, still doesn't work. Okay. Okay. The query has finally worked. For some reason, I got the underscore wrong. Anyway, so this is it. This query here has, we've used it, I've used it to get the data from the payment table and grouped the result by the customer ID. So this is the kind of thing that an aggregate function will do as well, because when an aggregate function is applied, it will return a single value as you've seen here, but you don't always have to use the aggregate function with a group by clause as I've illustrated in this example. I'm going to amend this query and add an aggregate function. The group by clause is always useful when it is used in conjunction with an aggregate function. For example, to get how much a customer has been paid, you can use a group by clause to divide the payment table into groups. For each group, you can calculate the total amount of money by using the sum aggregate function. So let's do that. I'm, I'm just going to amend this query. So I'll leave the column as a customer ID. And after the column, I'm going to apply an aggregate function called sum. And I'm going to do the sum on the amount. This table has an amount column, which is this here. This amount column is what I'm applying the aggregate function to. So let me execute this query. Ooh, made some error there. Amount. Okay, it thinks I've got the amount wrong. Yeah, what I should have done is put a comma after the first column here to indicate that I'm adding another column. So let's try again. Okay, that's much better. As you can see, the group by clause sorts the result set by customer ID and also adds up the amount that belongs to the same customer. So whenever the customer ID changes, it adds up the row to the returned result set. You can also use an order by with a group by clause. So what I can do, I can add an order by just at the bottom here. I'll get rid of that semicolon, come here and type in order by, and I'm going to order by the aggregate function and then the amount. And I'm going to do that in descending order. Okay, so watch out for this result output. It should change. I'm going to click on that. As you can see, the format has changed. So by adding the order by clause with the group by clause, it sorts the groups as well. You can also use the group by with a count function. So I'm going to modify this query slightly to use the count function. This payment table here has a staff ID. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change this customer ID to staff ID. 
and I'm going to apply a count function and the column I'm going to apply the aggregate function to is the payment ID so I'm going to change that and add a payment ID and I'm going to group the result by the staff ID and I'll get rid of the order by and put a semicolon to end the statement. So to count the number of transaction each staff has been processing, you group the payments table based on the staff ID and then you use the count function to get the number of transactions as this query indicates. All right, so let me run that and then we can see the output. So that's it. The group by clause sorts the result set by the staff ID. So it keeps a running total of the rows and whenever the staff ID changes, it adds the rows to the returned result set. So that's it for this lecture on using the group by clause. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, you'll learn how to use the having clause to eliminate groups of rows that do not satisfy a specified condition. The group by clause is usually used in conjunction with the group by clause. It is used to filter group rows that do not satisfy a specified condition. Let's have a look at the syntax to see how you would implement an having clause. So basically this is how you would implement it usually after the group by. So you start with the select keyword followed by the column name and then the aggregate function you want to use and inside the parentheses the aggregate function the column, the column you want to apply the aggregate function to. And then you specify the table name in the from field and then you apply the group by, by what column you're grouping it by. And then you apply the having condition. The having condition always comes after the group by. The having clause sets the condition for the group rows created by the group by clause. Although you can use the having clause with the group by clause in conjunction, in Postgres, you can use the having clause without the group by clause. So let me show you an illustration of how the having clause is used. Before I do that, I've got a query here. I just want to run. Basically, this query is just showing the group by clause. So I've got the select keyword. I'm using the custom ID from this payment table here. And I've got the sum aggregate function that I'm applying to this column called amount from the payment table. And I'm grouping it by the customer ID. So let me run that so you can see what it looks like before I add and having close. So this is what the query looks like at the moment. I'm going to add the having clause in order to implement or set some conditions. So after the ID here, I'm going to take off the semicolon and then implement the having clause. Inside the having clause is where I'm going to specify some conditions. So I'm saying having some And I'm going to use the amount column. So this is a condition of set. 
So after the group by has been applied using the customer ID, I've set extra condition using the using the having clause um, with the sum aggregate function. So it's going to apply to any amount greater than 200. So that's so we should have a much reduced output. So let me run that and you can see the result. You can see we've only the, so this by using the having clause, all the conditions that match this criteria have been displayed. You can see this amount here, these two amount match this, they're greater than 200. So this is an example of how you can use the having clause. Many thanks for watching and bye for now.